Welcome back to another fresh episode of the Kale Clark Show. It's so good to be with you. I am joined once again by, speaking of fresh, the freshly quaffed producer Lucas, <laughs> uh, who is uh, looking as uh, as slick as he ever has, as clean cut as he has in quite a while. So, well, uh, uh, thanks to my wife, she actually cut my hair. Um, love it. <laughs> she watched love some it. YouTube videos and learned how to cut. I mean. As an aside, like haircuts are getting so expensive these days. I'm like, oh, I know. Even at a standard basic place, they're like almost thirty dollars, and I'm like, nah. So shout out <laughs> to my wife. <laughs> love it, love it. Way to go, Gina. And I'll tell you what, we are going to talk about some more weighty matters today. Uh, the the feast of the Assumption of Mary obviously is a huge topic this week, August the fifteenth. We're going to break down the biblical basis of the Assumption of Mary. Maybe talk some NFL stuff too. Preseason games starting up. Faith, facts, and fun. You know it's the name of the game here on the Kale Clark Show. But but just to, to build on the haircut thing a little bit, it's so true. For for a long time, especially during COVID, my wife was cutting my hair as well, and she always cuts the dog's hair. And I figured, you know, if you could cut the dog's hair, I'm pretty <laughs> sure I can trust you with my lettuce up here. So she did the same thing. Checked out some YouTube videos. We got ourselves a kit online, and uh, nice. There you have it. There you have it. So at any rate, <laughs> love it. I, and I, I want to say to our listeners as well, it's been a hot minute since we had an episode. It's a couple of days behind schedule only because um, I was on vacation, a much needed vacation with my family and uh, producer Lucas. I know you're pretty curious about the T-shirt I'm wearing. I'm just going to uh, tilt my camera down yeah. so you can see this. <laughs> so you have to explain what Moosters <laughs> means. I yes. mean, I see the golf flag, but you yeah, have to exactly. Explain. Okay, so now if you're if you're watching the podcast on YouTube, and by the way, this is another reason why you should be subscribing to the Kale Clark Show on YouTube, because there are some video elements here that you're just not going to get if you're listening on audio. But I get it. I get it. Some people love to listen while they're walking the dog or in the car on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. But we thank you for subscribing on whatever platform you might be using. But uh, yeah, so I'm wearing this T-shirt that that I got when we were on vacation in Prince Edward Island, PEI, Canada. And for it, okay, so it's kind of a there's a there's an ice cream shop that's become hugely popular. It started in Prince Edward Island. It's called Cow's Ice Cream, and they are pretty viral. They they make incredible ice cream, and they also sell T-shirts. It's very they, they have a lot of sort of cultural plays. It's pretty funny stuff. Now, I will never play in the Masters golf tournament, but I might get to play in the Moosters. So so this is actually a, a sort of a, a spoof of the logo of the Masters. Uh, if you know the logo of the Masters, it's kind of the USA in yellow. And then uh, the, the, the flag in the golf hole is actually in Augusta, Georgia on the map. Well, this is a map of Prince Edward Island, and that's the birthplace of cows. Uh, where the stick is coming out of there. And of course, there's a cow nice. holding a golf bag. So <laughs> just to describe what I'm wearing, but uh, shout out to the folks at Cow's Ice Cream for making not only incredible ice cream, Wowie Cowie is kind of my favorite, but uh, for the <laughs> awesome t-shirts. And uh, it's funny That's also, so funny. My, my daughter got a Haler Swift uh, t-shirt as well, uh, featuring all kinds of farm animals and in it's a spoof. It's all it's all in good fun, but that's the origin of the T-shirt. And well, we got I like to it. About, yeah, you like it? I, like I love it. it. Well, I love as it. You know a Wisconsinite, where there's many cows, that's right. You know, America's Dairyland. Any cow reference is appreciated. So, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, that's the origin of the T-shirt. We we got to talk now about the origin of the Assumption of Mary. This is a big one, especially for. Uh, non-Catholic Christians to understand. And before we get into that, though, we have not yet cracked open our beverages of choice. We've got to do that. Lucas is rocking a Diet Coke. I've got Pepsi Zero Sugar. I don't discriminate, though. There we go. <laughs> Crack it open. Cheers. One day we'll have to do a blind taste test on the show of all the oh man sugar-free colas out there. <laughs> That would be uh, that would be interesting. I don't know if I actually could tell the difference, to be honest with you. Yeah, I've had but... friends bet me that I can't. I, I will say this right now: I think the Diet Coke is the best tasting of them all. In right now, I mean, I, I, I sort of change from time to time, but I, but I, I do like the taste of Diet Coke. I got to say that. But 
but I don't discriminate. I'll drink them all. And uh, let's talk about the assumption of Mary. Let's get into more weighty matters. And I remember very vividly, and I, 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 I've told you the story before, Lucas, when I was 21 years old, I was studying at Illinois State University, um, studying business. I was kind of on loan from my university in Canada. And this is the time when, when God really got a hold of my life. And I got a knock on the door one night. Now I was, I was a non-practicing Catholic. I, I was nominal growing up, wasn't very well catechized, kind of became an agnostic in high school and university. And one night in my off-campus apartment, I got a knock on the door for some people from a local Baptist church, very much knocking on doors like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses would, but uh, they were fundamentalist Baptists, uh, really kind folks, wonderful folks, a lot of misunderstandings about Catholicism. And I, I began to be very curious about what they were saying because I was looking for God. I was looking for answers, the ultimate meaning of life. And they helped me find those answers. They were very well versed in apologetics, especially about basic Christian apologetics, the, the resurrection of Jesus. That's really what uh, got me. If the resurrection happened, if the resurrection is real, then Christianity is right. God's not going to raise a heretic, a false teacher from the dead who's saying things like, I and the Father are one, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So th that that evidence really got me going. But they said, you got to get out of the Catholic Church. And I remember meeting with the young adults pastor uh, of this particular church in Normal, Illinois, a wonderful guy named Jerry. Yeah, and I don't know where Jerry is right now, but if you're somehow listening to this, I'm praying for you. Uh, a wonderful guy with a wonderful family. And I remember sitting at a McDonald's one night with him. I was 21 years old. And we started talking about Catholic doctrines. And one of the things he said, Lucas, was this whole business of the assumption of Mary, that Mary was raised body and soul to the glories of heaven. I mean, the Catholic Church promulgated this dogma, and it is a dogma. It is something that all Catholics must believe to hold the Catholic faith. They promulgated this dogma in the year 1950. He's like 1950. That that is roughly 2,000 years after the time of Jesus. Where are they pulling this stuff out of their keister? I mean, like uh, they, to him, it was like doctrinal invention. And I'm sorry to say that the the state of my Catholic formation at the time, I didn't even know what the assumption was, let alone how to explain it. Uh, so he he kind of threw me for a loop there. And I just nodded my head in silence. And, and really, Jerry and I, I like to say, had two things in common that day. Uh, number one, we were both sincerely seeking God. And we were both looking for God with all our hearts. But number two, we both had no idea what the Catholic Church really taught about the Assumption of Mary. So let's just state really quickly um, what it's all about. On November the 1st, 1950s, Jerry's right about this, the date, November the, November the 1st, 1950, Pope Pius XII solemnly defined the dogma of the Assumption of Mary when he wrote these words. And I love this doctrinal statement, Lucas, because it's so precise. You can actually tweet this. It's short enough to be tweeted, but it's just precise theological engineering language. I, I just love this. Uh, this is from the, the document is, is an apostolic constitution. It was called, uh, <laughs> this is a tongue twister, Munificentissimus Deus. And I'm not going to say that again, but you, you don't need to, to remember the, the title of the work, but, but the definition is definitely something that we want to be paying attention to. So Pius XII wrote this, quote, Mary, the immaculate, perpetually virgin mother of God. Okay, so that's the first part. I just love that because he's got the other three Marian dogmas right there. Uh, the Immaculate Conception, the fact that Mary's ever virgin, and that she's the mother of God. Those are the other three of the four uh, dogmas that we have to believe about Mary. The, other, the last one being, of course, the Assumption. So again, Mary, the Immaculate, Perpetually Virgin Mother of God, after the completion of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into the glory of heaven. End of quote. Now, my friend Jerry, he, he thought that this is essentially inventing a new doctrine. So it's, it wasn't. It's not an invention out of whole cloth. This is doctrinal development. It's defining something, actually, that was always part of what Catholics believed from the beginning. 
from the deposit of faith, like in Jude verse three, the deposit of faith once for all entrusted to the saints. We're kind of unpacking it. We're, we're, we're withdrawing money from the bank. We're, we're uh, uh, you know, peeling the onion back and looking at different layers inside, but it's, the, it's, it's always been part of the faith. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, there, there was a reason why Pius XII wanted to define this dogma at this time in 1950. And I know, Lucas, you wanted to talk a little bit about some thoughts that you had about that time period and why he might have done this when he did. Yeah, so I, I just think it's really interesting because you could say, why 1950? Like, why then? Out of all the times, if this was such a long-held belief, why wait so long to formally kind of define it? And um, the thing that I find so interesting about this, and I think it's, I mean, I definitely think it's of the Holy Spirit that this happened when it did. You look at the 20th century, and some people say it's the bloodiest century mm. in the history of humanity. World War One, World War Two, you have the Cold War, you have mm. Vietnam, you have the Korean War, all these wars, a lot of conflict, and... Pius XII is the Pope during World War II, so he's been in a position to where he's trying to do something to kind of make peace among the nations, although he, he was criticized at the time for not doing enough, not speaking out enough like his predecessor uh, had done. But what I like about this is that in a time where there's so much darkness, here you have the Pope coming forth with this encyclical and saying, yes, but this is the hope that we have as Christians. And mm. the, the reason I say the word hope there is because he publishes it on November the 1st, which is the Feast of All Saints. Interesting. And That's it's a point. reminder that even though there's death all around us, for the Christian, we have the same hope for glory that God gave to Mary that mm. we will be physically, bodily resurrected and um, be able to partake in the fullness of, of heaven when, when that day comes. And I just think that like, it's such a profound moment of hope uh, to lift this <clears throat> particular doctrine up that um, I just think it's just really interesting historically that it happened when it did. And, and I think it's a good reminder for us Christians that this isn't as much, and with all the previous Marian dogmas, it really has less to do with Mary than it does about God and about what God's plan right. is for his people and for salvation. And God's plan is for us to be with him physically as well. So I just thought that was super interesting. And um, God works in mysterious ways. I think he waited that long for a reason. Hmm. And uh, yeah, so I, I don't know what you... Yeah, I, if you have any thoughts on that either, but I, I agree with you, Lucas. I, I think I think that all those things were likely in his mind at some level when this proclamation was made, and and the the timing is is intriguing. He obviously felt it was the right time, and I, I always like to say that the dogmas of the church are a little bit like calluses on the human body. What do I mean by that? The, 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 the mystical body of Christ, of course, the church. I feel like the dogmas of the church are calluses on the mystical body of Christ. Because in our human bodies, we develop calluses. We develop thick skin where our body is under pressure the most. Like, you know, your heels are striking the ground all the time. Or uh, if you're playing golf at the Moosters <laughs> tournament. Listen, you know, I haven't been playing as much in these past uh, couple of years as I would like, but when I was really, you know, packing in a lot of rounds every year, my, I would get these golf calluses, uh, you know, on my hands from where I would hold a club. And they build up over time because of the pressure from the outside. So I, I, I think that just as it's necessary for the human body to develop a, a resistance, hard edges where there's a lot of pressure. The, the same thing is true for the dogmas of the church. They're, they're hard, defined areas of definition so that the body is preserved intact, especially the body of Catholic doctrine. And it's quite beautiful that when Pope Pius XII did this, and, and when he made this incredible statement, he talked about the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady, talked about the fact she's the mother of God, 
she's a perpetual virgin, the other three Marian dogmas. And, and then he slipped those into the, that one sentence definition. It, it's unbelievable. The immaculate, perpetually virgin mother of God, after the completion of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into the glory of heaven. And what's also interesting about this definition is that he was very careful not to say whether or not Mary actually died before she was assumed mm. body and soul into heaven. Now, that's kind of intriguing. Now, now, by the way, you're free to, and the way he defined this kind of tips this off, you're free to believe either that she did die or that she didn't die because that, that was not a matter of, of dogma. And when the mm. church hasn't ruled on something like that, you're free to believe whatever you want. And the overwhelming tradition, of course, fathers of the church, many great theologians of the past and, and modern thinkers as well, maintain, the vast majority maintain that she did, in fact, die. Not that she had to, and we'll get into that in just a second, but that she chose to in union with her divine son, her innocent son's death. Why? Well, she wasn't guilty. She she didn't have original sin. She didn't have any actual sin either, according to Catholic teaching and tradition. And, and it really, the assumption of Mary, is, as so many have noted, I remember Jim Burnham talking about this Catholic apologist. It's not strange at all if you think about the Immaculate Conception, because the church teaches that Mary was conceived full of grace. That, that's what the Immaculate Conception is all about. And when you look at Luke, in Luke chapter one, the Annunciation scene, when Gabriel greets Mary, he, he doesn't call her by her name. He calls her by her title. He says, hail, full of grace. And that's a Greek word, by the way. The original Greek word of Luke, in Luke's text is kakaratomene, kakaratomene. Now, you don't necessarily have to remember that either, but it's a past perfect participle in, in Greek. And I'll tell you what, I, I'm terrible with grammar. I never learned proper grammar rules growing up, just the way they did education when I was growing up. And so when I started studying Greek, um, doing my, my, my master's degree, it was really tough for me to, to get these grammatical categories, but I do know this, this, this term kakeratomene is a past perfect participle in Greek. W what does that really mean? It means that an action took place at some past time and it was perfectly done. It took place perfectly in the past. And it continues on out into the future, really into eternity as, as far as the eye can see, even farther. And, and that's the scriptural basis in some ways. It's one place for the Immaculate Conception. All right, but that's not the topic of, of, of today's show. But holding that, Mary didn't suffer from original sin. God prevented her from falling in in the first place. She was full of grace, had no actual sin. So God's supernatural life was always with her from the beginning. So it seems fitting that God would take her to be with him at the end of her earthly life, raise her body and soul to the glories of heaven. Now, again, most Catholics believe that she did die, even though she didn't necessarily have to, because as, as, as Paul writes in Romans, the wages of sin is death. Well, if there's no sin involved, then technically she didn't have to die, but that she chose to die in union with her son. And there's a church in Israel very close to the old city walls of Jerusalem called the Church of the Dormition. And I, I love that church. And that's one of the traditional sites and, and Catholics fight over this, like in, in Orthodox Christians as well. Where did Mary, where was she actually assumed into heaven? Because some people think it happened in Ephesus, uh, because of course she was under the care of the Apostle John. Son, here's your mother. Woman, here's your son. And John, of course, went to Ephesus, where he was essentially bishop there. Um, and so Mary was there with him. He was looking after her. But but a lot of people think, no, it happened in Jerusalem. And and there's a separate, there's an Orthodox church in Jerusalem. So, no, this is the place. But, but the Catholic church is the church of the dormition or the falling asleep of Mary. And I actually worked on an archaeological dig right, very, very close, within steps of the uh, church of the dormition, uh, doing my grad studies in Israel, uh, working with Dr. Craig Evans under the supervision of uh, Dr. Shimon Gibson, a British archaeologist, and we unearthed a high priestly mansion from the time of Jesus. That's a kind of a sidebar, but it was very close to that to that Church of the Dormition. It was always really important for me to go there and, and pray as much as I could because if this is the area or the vicinity where it happened, 
the Dormition, she simply you know, sort of fell asleep, a euphemism for death, and woke up in, in heaven. But John Paul II, St. John Paul II, is one of those who definitely believed, Lucas, that, that Mary did die. He said this, quote, the mother is not superior to the son who underwent death giving it a new meaning and changing it into a means of salvation, end of quote. So, so JP too certainly thought that Mary did die. Now the New Testament doesn't actually mention this happening. It doesn't have an account of the assumption of Mary, but we'll, we'll get into some of the biblical reasons why it does make sense with scripture as well in just a second. But, but I don't know if we all, you want to react to any of that, Lucas, as we go forward here. That's interesting. I didn't realize there was a debate about whether or not she died or didn't die. I mean, if you would have just asked me, uh, you know, before we started recording, I would have said, oh, she probably didn't die because she was sinless. <laughs> but so, so it's interesting that actually the majority of people say that she did. I mean, um, I, I, have, I have no idea. I think that'd be super cool to go to that church, though, in Jerusalem. And um, I... I love just the idea of like um that you mentioned with saint john paul ii there i mean like because the mother's not superior to the son i mean how beautiful is that to be like yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna mm. i don't have to do this but i'm going to because it's an even deeper way i can unite myself with our savior and um that's pretty awesome <laughs> yeah and well, you listen to the kale clark show by the way in podcast form on youtube podcasts Please subscribe also on Apple Podcasts and Spotify too. Well, let's let's talk about the Bible, the New Testament in particular, and the assumption of Mary, because the New Testament, as I just said a moment ago, doesn't mention the act. There's no historical account. Here's what happened on this particular day. And, and there are apocryphal accounts of this. There are all kinds of apocryphal uh, church documents that, that were written much, much later that have all the apostles gathered around her as she, quote unquote, falls asleep and actually watch her being <laughs> assumed to have, you know, things like that. Okay. Not exactly. I'm not saying that's not how it happened, but from a historical perspective, that doesn't impress people who aren't Catholic. And they, they want to say, where is it in the Bible? Non-Catholic Christians, especially. Right. And first thing we would say is that not everything that we have to believe as Christians is in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but but the Trinity in terms of the concept certainly is that God is a Trinity of persons. Um, in the Catholic Church, of course, the word of God comes to us really in two ways. Sacred scripture, obviously, uh, the word of God written and sacred tradition, uh, which is the word of God handed down uh, through oral teaching. And of course, e even sacred scripture used to be sacred tradition before it was uh, put into written form. But of course, there are many uh, New Testament documents, especially Paul's letters that speak of a tradition that he expected them to know that that wasn't in the documents. But that, that's another show for an, another day. We also have to think about this. Here's another interesting point that Mary, when the New Testament was written, was probably still alive, if not for the writing of all of the books, some of the books. So this probably happened afterwards. I, I personally think that all the New Ta Testament books were finished before 70 AD because mm -hmm. not one of them mentions the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, which is a direct fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus. Now, of course, it's alluded you, to. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you think that um, it's actually interesting now that you, you mentioned the Gospel of Luke earlier. Um, do you think that Luke actually interviewed Mary and actually that's where he got his account from partially? I do. I do. One thousand percent. Thousand percent. How does he get all this inside information about the Annunciation, about the visitation? Uh, it seems like the infancy narrative in Luke's gospel is certainly informed from Mary's own perspective. It seems likely, I think there's a really good chance that he interviewed Mary. Um, and in fact, when you look at Luke's prologue, the first few verses of his gospel, he says that he carefully investigated everything from the beginning. So perhaps that's how he ascertained all, all these details about the nativity. The other, but the other thing I want to mention too, is that even though non-Catholic Christians might not realize this, all Christians, if they believe that the Bible is the word of God, all Christians, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, believe that assumptions happen. 
that God makes assumptions, if you will. He raises people into the glory of heaven, body, and soul. Why? Because this is in scripture. Look at the case of Enoch. Enoch is mentioned in, in Genesis. He's also mentioned in, in the book of Hebrews. In the letter to the Hebrews, uh, chapter 11, verse 5, that famous hall of fame of, of faith chapter, Enoch is taken up. He doesn't see death. He's not to be found because God took him. And he had been commended as one who pleased God. Now, in Genesis 5, verse 24, it says that Enoch walked with God and then he was no more. Now, what does that mean? Uh, is it like that meme of the kid, you know, that famous meme of the, of the kid where he's like, peace out, and he just disappears, like he just <laughs> disintegrates? Is that what happened with Enoch? Well, yeah, I don't know. He was, in all likelihood, beamed up. He, 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 was, he was assumed body and soul into heaven. And also the prophet Elijah, Lucas, you know this. Elijah was assumed into heaven, body and soul, by a chariot of fire. And that's really appropriate. We just had the Olympics, chariots of fire. A chariot of fire, the first one is in the Bible, and a windstorm. You could read about that in 2 Kings chapter 2. I mean, so the, the, the precedent is there. The concept is there. This shouldn't be something that any Christian could say, no, this doesn't happen. This type of thing, God would never do this. Well, he did in the past. Yeah. Well, and didn't it wasn't Moses assumed into heaven as well? Or, I don't know if that's debated or not. But I know that he, I know that in the letter of Jude, it mentions yes. that like Saint Michael and uh, the yep. devil were kind of feuding over the body of Moses, which is kind of a mysterious passage. Um, yeah, and I don't really know what to make of it. There's a lot of interesting stuff there, but. Um, does I mean, doesn't that kind of indicate that he was also taken up body and soul? Yeah, that, that that's a great point. <laughs> and, and New Testament readers have often puzzled over that that passage, saying like, "Where is this in the Old Testament?" And, and the the answer is, it's not. That's actually a reference to, in all likelihood, a Jewish document called the Assumption of Moses, which does get into this. Uh, so, you know, the writer is certainly aware of that of that document. It's part of the cultural milieu in which he was operating, if you will. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's another kind of sidebar thing, too. It was Moses assumed into heaven. That's kind of an interesting um, interesting uh, sidebar uh, discussion for another day. And some of these extra biblical documents um, around the time of the writing of the New Testament that were floating around certainly are, are instructive to, to at least they, they help us understand the context of of the New Testament and, and the Messiah. What kind of Messiah were the Jews expecting at that time? Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls are really really good for that too. But he, here's another thing as well, uh, Lucas. And so many writers have pointed this out that it is quite remarkable that throughout Christian history, no city has ever claimed, no church has ever claimed to have the bodily relics of Mary. Now, you know how big we are in relics in the Catholic Church. I mean, how many churches, how, how, how many reliquaries, how, how many incredible... St. Peter's itself is built over the tomb of the Apostle Peter. And by the way, you can check it out. You, if you go to Rome, you can go on a tour of what are called the Scabby, the underground burial places underneath St. Peter's. And, and they found in the 1960s, Peter's burial place. And they found the bones of a guy who was you know, probably in his late 60s, mid to late 60s, burly guy, maybe like a fisherman. The skeleton was missing its feet. Why? Well, probably because when he was crucified upside down, he was probably just ripped off the cross. They didn't care. He wasn't he wasn't a Roman citizen. Um, but there's all this graffiti. And yeah, Catholics did graffiti. And it was here is Peter. Here lies Peter. It was obviously a, a place of prayer for the for the early Christians. So I think it's it's a pretty good warrant to believe that Peter's relics um, were underneath the Vatican. So relics are huge. The grand prize of all relics would have been the relics of the mother of God, the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, nobody ever claimed to have the bodily relics of Mary because... That's super interesting. That's super interesting. Because, <laughs> yeah, if somebody did, they would have been, like, publicizing it tremendously. Like, we have relic of mary we have a relic of mary like you know and uh the fact that nobody ever makes that claim is i've actually never thought about that before that's really interesting yeah i mean yeah. it's kind of an argument from silence in a certain way but it is corroborating yeah. evidence it's quite remarkable 
if somebody had him, you'd think someone would have said so, at least to attract attention to themselves, if not, if nothing else. But um, I think I think it's absolutely um, uh, crucial there. Um, the other thing too that I think. Um, people need to understand about, I want to get back to these de defined dogmas um, and back to what my friend Jerry said some years ago that the Catholic church invented this dogma in 1950. It's not the case. It is part of sacred tradition and always has been from the beginning. And a lot of people ask the question, Lucas, well, where can I find a list of all the sacred traditions? Because I know where to find sacred scripture, and obviously Catholics and Protestants argue about how many books should be in the Bible. Folks, they we have the same number of New Testament books, 27, different numbers of Old Testament books. But fair enough, I, that argument aside, I know where to find sacred scripture, but is there a document somewhere that lists the 187 sacred traditions that I need to believe in order to be Catholic? I'm not saying there is one at 187. There's no necessarily number to it. Where do I find out about sacred tradition? Now, that is an excellent question. What, what would you say to that, Lucas? Where would someone find out about sacred tradition? <laughs> I mean, my first thought <laughs> is the catechism. <laughs> yeah, the catechism is not a bad spot. But um, I honestly don't know. <laughs> well, there, there's an ancient saying, and you know this full well, um, that, that's been, been said. It's a Latin saying, lex Credendi Lex Orandi. Lex, and I always think of Lex Luther, but but Lex actually means law in, in, in Latin. So Lex Credendi Lex Orandi. What does that mean? It means the law of belief is the law of prayer. So another way to say that is the church believes as she prays. If you want to know what Catholics believe, listen to their prayers. Listen to the content of their prayers. If you want to know what the what the ultimate prayer of the church is, it's the mass, right? It's the highest form of prayer that we have. And, and if you want to know what Christians believed from the beginning, take a look at how they prayed, how they worshipped. And just because Pius XII formally defined the dogma of the Assumption in 1950 doesn't mean that he invented it, far from it. Catholics believed this for centuries. The, like God was always a trinity of persons before the Council of Nicaea affirmed it in the fourth century. The only reason why this hard callous, this dogma needed to be defined back then was because it was challenged. I mean, this raving heretic Arius, the worst heretic in the, in the history of the church, had gotten over half of the church's bishops to believe that Jesus was a creature, that he was not divine. That's essentially what it, what it was. And the church needed to define the truth. And that's what they did. In the same way, the church always knew from the time it happened that Mary had been assumed into heaven. In fact, the church had celebrated the assumption of Mary in the liturgy, the highest form of prayer in the church, going back to at least the fourth century. So again, lex credendi, lex orandi, the church believes as she prays. So, so it, when, you, when you put all these arguments together from history and sacred tradition, the liturgy, the way the church has always prayed about it, it makes sense. And scripture is certainly not, a, even if there's no account of, of here's where the assumption happened and when it happened and, and how it shook down, it, scripture is certainly not against it. The principle is there. And I actually have a couple more little hidden gems from scripture about, about the assumption in just a second. But, but here's another argument. The argument, I guess you could say this is the argument from common sense or the argument from fittingness. It was fitting that God did this for Mary. And when you, when you go to Mass on the, on the Solemnity of the Assumption, you're going to hear a preface for the Eucharistic prayer. And here's what it says. It says, quote, you would not, as a prayer to God, of course, quote, you would not allow decay to touch her body for she had given birth to your son, the Lord of all life in the glory of the incarnation. End of quote. So that, that's the, the argument from what we might call fittingness. It makes good common sense. It makes supernatural sense that God would raise Mary because she carried within her life itself, you know, the life, J Jesus Christ. It, it doesn't make sense that God would allow 
her to decay, to be to be given over to to death in that sense. And another part of the common sense argument as well, and a lot of saints have, have said this one too, Lucas, throughout the centuries. Um, if St. Francis de Sales was one that I can I can mention off the top of my head, they basically said, listen, if you were God and you had the ability to raise your own mother, you know, to the glories of heaven, would you do it? You know, <laughs> I mean, our own mothers are not sinless. I mean, they're, they're pretty good. Let me like, it might've burned the cookies once or something, but, but, but Hey, if I could do it for my mom, I totally would. Well, God could do it. Jesus could do it for his mom and she totally deserves it. She totally deserves it. Jo Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict the 16th, he, he wrote a book. He co-wrote it along with Hans Urs von Balthasar. And it was called Mary, the church at the source. Great book, great book. Mary is the original disciple. She's the first Christian. She's the first person to say yes to God's plan to save the world through her son, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be a part of it, a major part of it. I'm going to help bring heaven to earth by my fiat. It's not just an Italian car. I, by my fiat, I'm saying, yes, you know, I, I, the incarnation happens. Heaven comes to earth. And, and, and we, and when she's raised to heaven, you know, earth goes to heaven in a certain sense, right? And it's kind of a, a preview of the, the new heavens and the new earth in a certain sense. We'll be in our resurrected, glorified bodies in the new creation. But but Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, said she's the first disciple. It makes sense that she'd be the first to receive the everlasting blessings, the, the fruit of the gospel. She was the first to, to, to keep that word of God of the gospel. Uh, Luke 138, Luke 145, she responds to God's will so promptly be it done unto me according to thy word. And so she's always there, the foot of the cross. Um, John is there too. But but JP too, in his letter on the rosary, um, said, here's another quote from JP too, in his, his apostolic letter on the rosary, the new mysteries of light that he brought in, the luminous mysteries. He said, quote, in the ascension of Christ, he was raised in glory to the right hand of the Father. Now, the difference of the ascension is Christ as God ascends under his own power as God. He's raised in glory to the right hand of the Father, while Mary herself would be raised to that same glory in the assumption, enjoying beforehand by unique privilege the destiny reserved for all the just at the resurrection of the dead, quote unquote. So again, she kind of gets a sneak preview of what we're all going to experience in, in the afterlife. It's interesting. I, I um, so I'm curious, Kale, and I think you may touch on this, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on people saying that revelation chapter 12 yeah. is a biblical text that supports the dogma of the assumption of Mary. Yeah. Yeah. And if that's, um, if if that's if that's convincing or if it's like our oh, Catholics just using this as a kind of a proof text or you know, um, it's an interesting thought because the, Mary is, is the Ark of the New Covenant, and the Ark in the Old Covenant has never been found, and yeah, that's so true. <laughs> it makes their you know, cue Indiana Jones music, but yeah, um, yeah exactly. Uh, so it's like, what happened to it? And in a similar sense, you could say, mm -hmm. if Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant, where is she? <laughs> yeah. why, is she why has nobody found her body? <laughs> so it's consistent with the Old Testament in a way, too, yeah. one could argue. But <laughs> Yeah, there's some great typology there. The idea that in typology, of course, it's just this concept that God writes history the way human beings write with words. It's just human writers might use foreshadowing to tip off a murder mystery, like who done it? God uses actual people, places, things, events to foreshadow even greater realities in the new covenant. And, and that's one of the big ones that you mentioned, Lucas, that Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. And let me let me just before we get into Revelation 12, this is it's kind of related. So this is really interesting. When Pope Pius himself, when he proclaimed this dogma in 1950, I want to I want to share with you one of the biblical texts that he used in explaining the assumption. And this is one that we might not think of necessarily off the top of our head. He actually looked at Psalm 132. Psalm 132. That Psalm talks about the Ark of the Covenant being brought up by King David into the temple in mm -hmm. Jerusalem. 
Isn't that interesting? Here's what it says. Psalm 132, verse 8. I'm going to read this for you. Arise, O Lord, and go to thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy might. Isn't that interesting? Arise, O Lord. Now I'm going to take the old English out of it for a second. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Interesting. So when you read Luke's gospel, Luke knows biblical typology very, very well. He knows the Old Testament really well. And the visitation scene, and we can, we'll have to do this on another show, but he's clearly, the way he writes the visitation, he's clearly portraying Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant. Because in the Old Covenant, David took the Ark to the hill country of Judea, and he parked it at the home of this guy named Obed-Edom. And he left it there for three months because he thought someone had died from touching the Ark. David knows that he's, you know, Uzzah got zapped for touching the ark. David knows he's unworthy. He's sinful. He's like, oh, what's going to happen to me? God knows what a sinner I am. I'm just going to like use Obed-Edom as a guinea pig here. I'm going to leave the ark at his house for three months and see what happens. Well, he comes back and the guy's not only dead, but he and his, not only not dead, he and his whole family have, he's very much alive and he's been totally blessed. He's like, okay, I think I can now bring up the ark to Jerusalem. He does so with festive dancing. And this is where he kind of dances like a maniac in front of the ark. And his wife is like, you're totally embarrassing yourself. And he's like, yeah, and I'm going to do even more of this, you know, because of my joy dancing before the Lord. And Luke picks up on this as David dances before the ark, John the Baptist in the womb of his mother, Elizabeth, leaps for joy when Mary arrives on the scene. Of course, the living Jesus this is how she's the Ark of, of the New Covenant. Now, Lucas, let me quiz you here. What, was it, what, what did the Old Testament Ark contain? The Ten Commandments. Yep. So the two, the two tablets of stone. Uh, the Rod of Aaron. That yep, blossoms. very good. Yep. And manna from the desert. You got it. A jar of the manna, right? <laughs> so so jar of the manna, the, living, the, the bread that came, the miracle bread that came down from heaven to feed the Israelites on their journey to the promised land. Then, of course, there's the priestly staff of Aaron, the great high priest, and then there's the word of God on stone tablets that God gave to Moses, the Ten Commandments. So that's what was in the old ark. And what Mary is the ark of the new covenant. What does she contain in her body? Not the word of God on stone tablets, but a person, the word made flesh, Jesus, the living word of God. He is the great high priest. Forget about the staff of Aaron. He is the great high priest, according to the letter to the Hebrews. And of course, he is the living bread that come down from heaven, uh, the manna, the new manna. Uh, as he says in the great Eucharistic chapter, John chapter 6, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh, John six fifty one. So this is the, the, the Eucharistic Lord, you know, the Eucharist he's going to give us. And so uh, what's also intriguing about that, too, is that the old ark was made of acacia wood, which to the Hebrews was considered to be incorruptible wood, which is kind of mm. interesting because, because this idea that, you know, Mary was preserved from corruption. You know, she was raised body and soul to the glories of heaven, incorruptible. That's, that's, uh, that's pretty wild stuff. And so just as David took the old ark to the Jerusalem temple, enthroned it there, now Jesus takes Mary the Ark of the New Covenant, to her ultimate resting place in the New Jerusalem above. Um, that, that's, that's pretty wild stuff. And so Pius XII mentioned Psalm 132, which I think was a great thing to put in that document. And another thing that he mentioned was, another scripture was, and this is, again, one that wouldn't come to mind necessarily, but it makes perfect sense. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. And that's, of course, the fourth commandment. Mm -hmm. Exodus 20 is one of the chapters that has the Ten Commandments in it. What's the fourth commandment? Honor your father and mother. Well, Jesus did that. He's the living word of God. He's the author of the commandments, and he also fulfilled them perfectly. And he honored his heavenly father, of course, his foster father, Joseph, yes. But he honored his mother, Mary. And the ultimate honor was he took her to be with him assumed her body and soul into heaven so that so all that is background now let's talk about that revelation passage that you mentioned lucas that's of course revelation chapter 12. now we do know this that when the the book of revelation was written it was written on on a papyrus scroll in all likelihood and there were no 
chapter and verse divisions. All the books of the New Testament did not have chapter and verse. Those were added later by scribes to help us, or copying the text to help us to, to find our place. And I, I'm glad they did, that they did that. It makes our work a lot, a lot easier. But the original text, you've got chapter 11 going right into chap, what is now chapter 12. There's no break in the text. And, and you mentioned how the old Ark of the Covenant was hidden away. Well, this, that, the first readers of the book of Revelation in the first century coming from a Jewish background, like they would have been mesmerized by this because at the end of Revelation 11, an angel picks up a trumpet. The seventh angel blows the trumpet, the great victory of God. And what does John the Revelator see? Go right into the next chapter, Revelation 12, verse 1. He says, I see the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. That's what he says at the end of 11, starting with verse 19. And I'm just going to give this give you this quote here. Um, God's temple in heaven was opened and the Ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, loud noises, peals of thunder, an earthquake and heavy hail. And then it goes right into chapter 12. And again, there's no original, there's no chapter division in the original text. So it's not a new subject that he's talking about in the next chapter. And then what does he say? And then he starts talking about a woman. Chapter 12, verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child, and she cried out in her pangs of birth and anguish for delivery. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems upon his head. So just, just to back it up a little bit, in the year 587 BC, the prophet Jeremiah hid the old ark, the ark of the old covenant, to protect it, if you will, from raiders of the lost ark, right? Like the Babylonians, like, he, he was, like the Babylonians were invading. They're going to take the ark. They're going to desecrate it. I got to hide it. So he hid it. And to this day, nobody knows where it is. Nobody knows where it is. So he's... So this is what and this is all by the way chronicle in, in the second book of Maccabees. So so this idea when 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 people are reading Revelation, like wow, now he sees the ark and it's in heaven. Hold, hold on here, and then he starts talking about the woman. No no no, it's mm. not the box, it, it's not the old ark. This is a woman. Now who is the woman is the question, right? And and this is where there's a lot of uh, debate as well. But let me just tell you first of all who the dragon is. We know, I mean, that's a dead giveaway. It's the devil. Um. Great red dragon, seven heads, ten horns, uh, seven diadems upon his head. So the, the horns and the, the the crowns are signs of power. And his tail sweeps down a third of the stars of heaven, casts them down to earth. Who, what, what do they represent? Lucas, you know this. The tail sweeps down a third of the stars of heaven, casts them to earth. Uh, my mind is blanking on this one, actually demons I... like they're fallen oh, okay. angels right okay. so he basically it's saying like he took a third of the angels down with him mm. in his rebellion against god that so the demons were created to be good god doesn't make junk the demons were created to be good they were originally angels and they became fallen angels hence demons so they're pictured as stars of heaven cast down to the earth and then the dragon stands before the woman she's about to bear a child that he might devour her child when she brought it forth, and she brings forth a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And by the way, that's an allusion to Psalm 2, a messianic psalm. So, okay, Joseph Ratzinger, again, I've got to go back to Pope Benedict XVI, because he pointed out many, many times in his writings, a lot of people will say, hold on here, the woman's not Mary, it's Israel. It's a representation of daughter Zion because the Messiah comes from Israel. And he's like, yeah, that's fine. That's, that's also true. That's also true. It's not an either or, it's a both and. In fact, Mary is daughter Zion in the sense that she is the true ideal Israelite woman, daughter Zion personified. So she, yeah, the woman is a symbol of Israel, but, it, but, but historically, the woman bringing forth the child. We know the child is Jesus, so the woman can only be Mary if we're looking at, you know, reading it in a liberal sense, if you will, because the son that she gives birth to is Christ. And of course, the devil went after both of them from the very beginning of Jesus' life on earth. 
Uh, and this is why they had to flee into Egypt uh, to escape the wrath of Herod, who's kind of a, a tool of the devil, if you will. And um, that's that's um, that's a great biblical basis there, Revelation chapter 12, Lucas. Well, that's, I mean, when you add all that up, it's interesting. I mean, when you take the biblical precedent from Enoch and Elijah and uh, Moses, and then you look at the Psalms that you referenced, you look mm. at Revelation, you look at the fact that there's no relics, you look at um, the worship of the church. I mean, you add all this together, that's a pretty strong case for the yeah. dogma of the assumption that I feel like would be uh, difficult to refute if you were struggling with this dogma. Um, mm. You know, you I, I just the cumulative effects of, of all of that, um, I think, makes a really good case for mm. rationally. With it, it's like, okay, this is good. This is this is pretty good. It's pretty good. Like, there's still an element of faith there, you know? Like, it takes faith sure. to believe it. But, um, yeah. You know, there's something else, and then this may be dovetailing, Kale, but mm -hmm. there's something that's situated in our own historical moment that I've, I've been kind of thinking about, which is the, 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 the thing about this particular dogma, the assumption is that, obviously, it emphasizes the body and the importance yeah. of the body. And yeah. in our own time, when you have, you know, artificial, artificial intelligence, uh, all these kind of uh, new technologies that are emerging, social media, digital worlds, um, to have the, the physicality of something like the assumption uh, celebrated, I think is a really good mm. um, witness to just the fact that our bodies really do matter. No pun yeah. intended there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, what's the so matter? you know it's it's uh, it's so important. Like because somebody was like, "Why are we making such a big deal about this?" <laughs> but mm. yet at the same time, like, what a great opportunity to evangelize and witness to the dignity of our bodies as human beings, and that they really do matter. Like, and that we will have yeah. physical bodies in heaven. That's right. I love. I love. I mm -hmm. absolutely love the idea of actually running through a field physically <laughs> yeah, you know not just like right. yeah like i don't know and and in the verse from isaiah i always love like you will run and not grow weary i always think like what would that actually be like to run wow. and not get tired <laughs> that's know? incredible yeah um so yeah those are just kind of some random thoughts but um it's such a it's such a good dogma and i think it's especially relevant for our current time as well you know not just 70 years ago or whatever but um it's a good tool to use for evangelization right now. I agree 100. percent And so, yeah, I, I, thinking about that, yeah, running and not growing weary. Speaking of chariots of fire, that scene in the movie where they're running on the beach, that famous scene, you're running on heavenly shores and never, never getting tired, mm -hmm. is a, is a pretty awesome thing to think about. So heaven is a real physical place for real physical resurrected bodies, and glorified bodies. That's something that, yeah, our souls are separated from our bodies at death, but it's only a temporary state. It's not the end game. Yeah. And uh, this is the way God always intended us to live. And, and certainly, you know, again, in 1950, when, when the Pope defined this dogma, they'd just come out of World War II. And so many human bodies, the bodies of the people of God were, were desecrated, were destroyed in torture chambers at Auschwitz. And we think about the great St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, St. Edith Stein, and we celebrated her fe feast day recently. That, that probably was all in, in, in the... Uh, the back of the mind of the Pope as well, how the human body had been uh, denigrated. And we see it even more so in our own time. And so, yeah, I, I think that is, that, that is a big, a big thing to, to contemplate there. And here's another thing that kind of struck me as well. Uh, Dr. Edward Sri, Dr. Ted Sri, in, in uh, one of his books on, on the queenship of Mary, uh, had, had a really interesting thought about this, about the assumption of Mary, how, you know, aside from, Enoch and Elijah, she kind of goes where goes, goes boldly where no one has gone before, you know, to borrow another Star Trek image, um, to live with God bodily, you know, in, in his presence. That's, that's pretty, think about the impact that the assumption had on Mary herself, mm. 
uh, Dr. Sri talked about this. It's something that we often wouldn't think about, but think about her, her love for her son. Think, think about the humiliation that she suffered and she underwent as he was humiliated on the cross and she was there. And, and her longing to be with him again, you know, after he ascended into heaven, that was finally fulfilled. Would have been fulfilled eucharistically, obviously, too. But, but, but in heaven, to to be with her son again. And when you when you see paintings, uh, works of art depicting the Assumption of Mary, you see Mary rising on a cloud. There are all these cherubs around, you know, receiving her great celebration breaking out in heaven. But but Doctor Sri talked about a piece of art that not too many people have heard of. It's it's actually um, on one of the main doors of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And it's often people don't, they kind of miss it when they pass by. It portrays Mary's last moments on earth before her assumption. In, in this depiction, Mary isn't rising to the heavens. She's actually falling, which is so interesting. Mm. She's falling. She's letting go of the sufferings of this world and allowing herself to, to fall asleep, to fall into the everlasting arms, if you will, abandoning herself once again in, into the hands of the father. And, and just, just as her son did, you know, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Mm. And the angels rush down to catch her as she's falling and take her, raise her up to the glories of heaven. And that's, such a great image because we do live through a lot of suffering in this valley of tears. You know, we pray this in the Hill Holy Queen, this veil of tears. And we, we ask her to intercede for us. We ask Mary to pray for us, not only to lift up our hearts to heavenly realities, but, but one day that God will also raise our bodies from the sleep of death and bring them along with her into the presence of our Lord. That's an incredible to think, thing to think about whenever we pray. And... and that that fourth glorious mystery of the rosary, the assumption, you know, we, we pray that constantly, especially uh, on Wednesdays and Sundays when we pray those glorious mysteries. It's something that we can never forget that she's in the presence of our Lord. She, when she walks in his presence, you know, we, we ask her to speak, speak well of us and, 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 and intercede for us. And you know, how powerful, that, how incredible and how immeasurably joyful it would have been for Mary. Yeah. Uh, we probably don't have time for this podcast, Carol, but I'd be curious to get your thoughts on whether or not you think St. Joseph was assumed. Body Ooh, soul. wow. And, wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of I've discussion heard, about that, too. I've heard debates about that. And um, yeah, it'd be interesting. That would, that would be a whole other episode. But uh, um, there may be good reason <laughs> to think that he was as well. So. Wow. Oh, wow. That's, that's definitely a <laughs> teaser for a future episode, for sure. But of course... <laughs> We could really look at Joseph and Mary as patron saints of a happy death. And of course, we don't know for sure whether or not Mary died, but, but um, you know, the traditional yeah. image as well is imagine Joseph, in all likelihood, he did die um, before Jesus began his earthly ministry. He's not mentioned uh, anymore as Jesus as an, as an adult. But the idea that, that Jesus and Mary at the bedside of Joseph, you know, wow, kind of closing his eyes, imagine waking up in, in eternity and there they are again or something. It, it's uh, Hey, wait a minute. Deja vu all over again, but better. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that'll be, that's a great topic to talk about in, in a future show for sure. But I, I do think um, we probably, I think we'll, it's probably a good time to stop it here. We, we would rather leave the people saying so soon rather than at last. So <laughs> we'll save that one for another time. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, I, uh, I'm gonna have to make a trip up to Prince Edward Island to Moosters and yeah. try some ice cream. Um, you you got to go to Cow's Ice Cream. You got to go to Prince Edward Island, and uh, of course, that is also the setting of Anne of Green Gables. And this is a, something that I don't know if your wife was into this when she was a little girl, but but my wife Trish loved the Anne of Green Gables novels by Lucy Maud Montgomery. In fact, that the, the uh, final resting place of Lucy Maud Montgomery was right across from the motel we were staying at the graveyard mm. there and uh yeah so going to the green gables house uh, on prince edward island and just being there where these uh wonderful uh, books were set was uh, was pretty moving for my wife big part of her childhood and uh and cool. lots of great golf courses there too i didn't get to play them this time but but uh, i'll have a moosters tournament next time i go maybe you can come <laughs> with me that sounds good i'm down <laughs>
All right. All right. Well, listen, uh, it's so great to be back on track for a lot of people. Of course, the kids are back in school in the United States and uh, things are kicking into high gear for the fall. And we've got lots of great episodes planned for you in the future here on the Kale Clark Show. So once again, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube podcasts. If you're not on the email list, what is keeping you? Go to kaleclark.com, C-A-L-E, Clark with an E, kaleclark.com. And then just leave your first name and your email, and I'll make sure that you get updated on any new podcasts. And you can also email me. The email is kale, C-A-L-E, at kaleclark.com. And if you have any questions or topics that you'd like us to cover on the podcast, we'd love to hear from you. So don't forget to subscribe on YouTube Podcasts, on Apple Podcasts, and also on Spotify. And I tell you what, we got we to work on a set here. I've got the curtain behind me. And I, it kind of reminds me of the Joe Rogan show. He's got that curtain behind his guests. You know, yeah, I don't have nearly as many listeners, but uh, it's not an homage to Joe Rogan. Uh, we got to get some uh, some cool gadgets. And I, I'm watching all yeah. these podcasts with with, with people of awesome uh, sort of I don't know backdrops and, and that sort yeah. of reflect the flavor of the show. So I don't know. We've got to think about that too, Lucas. Yeah, no, no, that's good. I thought about putting some LED lights around the top of the. Uh... A little room that we've got in here so far, but um, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. It's the next <laughs> level. But uh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode of The Kale Clark Show. Producer Lucas Holt with me as always. We'll catch you in the next episode. Share it with a friend. Take it away, Michaela.